Hello, everyone. As you're coming to the room, I'm going to use a little bit of the oxygen to say hello and welcome. Uh, of course, you may know me from other past episodes of Donor Search's Philanthropy Mastermind series. This is a bit special. It goes back to something we've been doing in different guises uh, over the last few years as our relationship with the Giving Institute, Giving USA Foundation has grown. Um, but we are really very fortunate today to have several leading voices uh, in the world of community foundation giving and donor advised funds talking with you, sharing from their experience about what donor advised funds are all about, and especially with the lens of the Giving Institute's new report on donor advised funds, hence the title of today's session. If you want to know anything about donor search, of course, we won't be talking about that unless one of the panelists brings it up. So if you'd like to learn more, please just uh, take a, a look over at donorsearch.net after the program today where you'll find a recording of today's session that you can share with people who couldn't make it live and uh, it'll also be on YouTube as well. But uh, you can also find their recordings of past sessions. We've done over 600 programs going back to 2016, as well as a calendar of things coming up in the near future. So we hope you'll join us for all that. Again, that's at donorsearch.net. But what I wanna do right now is just to do introductions, especially my friend Ryan, and then get out of the way so you can hear a lot about the, probably the, the biggest most uh, impressive force in the growth of philanthropy over the last few years, donor advised fund. So I'll start by introducing Ryan. Uh, Ryan, as you can see right there, uh, is an advisor to donor search. Um, he is responsible for building the partnerships team at the company and has been with the firm for over a decade. He's worked with hundreds of firms, but he also notably here in this context serves on the board of both AFPDC and the Giving Institute and also fundraises for the Giving USA Foundation. So uh, he knows uh, where of this data comes from. We also have three um, phenomenal panelists today that I'll introduce to you, hopefully in alphabetical order if my mind works right. One is uh, Karima Amlani, um, who's right there waiting, I hope. Karima uh, has been working uh, most recently uh, right there in Genesee County um, uh, at the, um, uh, the Community Foundation of Greater Flint. Um, she's been committed to, uh, committed to community leadership in Flint and Genesee County for quite a number of years, and you'll be learning a lot more about her, uh, her work as vice president of the Community Foundation today. Uh, we also have uh, with us uh, Vicki Galberer, uh, who is the research manager and strategy group manager at Vanguard Charitable. If you don't know what Vanguard is, well, uh, you'll learn a lot about it here, but I hope you'll want to learn a lot more about it after we're done. We won't be talking about Vanguard that you may know from your investments, but rather Vanguard Charitable, which is, of course, a leading U.S. nonprofit and sponsor of donor advised funds. It's a major force in the sector. And we also are very pleased to have with us Lisa Stratton, who's a senior philanthropic advisor for the Arizona Community Foundation, um, where she oversees ACF's professional advisor outreach system, including professional advisory board. Um, so a lot of experience here whose resumes are much larger than I could only allude to. Um, but with that, I want to turn the baton over to my friend Ryan so he can get us underway. Ryan, I think you're still on mute. There you go. Yeah, I, I figured it out as you were saying that. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much, uh, Jay, uh, for the kind introductions and for having us. And thanks, everybody, for joining today. We're really excited. Um, so let's dive in to today's agenda. We already did the intros, um, but after that, we're going to talk about donor advised funds. What are they? Um, and then we're going to go into, well, why donor advised funds? What's, what's interesting about them? And why is that a good fit for a donor? Why, why might that be a good fit for nonprofits? And that's all going to be led uh, by our wonderful panelists. Um, then I'm going to dive into some donor advised fund giving trends. Um, that data comes from both the Giving USA report, the new chapter on donor advised funds, which we're very excited about. Um, and then again, the panel's gonna dive in. And after that, probably one of the most interesting parts is some tactical recommendations. Well, what do we do? How do we engage donor advised fund uh, holders? And then we'll open it up for Q and A. So that said, the questions will be at the end, but as questions come to you, please ask them. So we make sure we can answer them when we get to the end. Uh, this is the obligatory headshots. We're gonna skip that. Um, all right. So let me just very quickly highlight 
what is the Giving USA report? Because the, the focal point here is there's a chapter on donor advised funds in the report, right? So the highlight is that the Giving USA report is the longest running report on philanthropy in the US. Um, this report as an example is why we have historical records of how the US gives during a recession. Um, so we're not gonna stay on this slide long, but I just wanna highlight for historical context and where we are today. Um, the gold bars that you see, those indicate recessions, recession years. Um, the bars themselves, they adjust for inflation. Um, and the line is the value of giving in current dollars. So as an example, in 1981, the line shows $137 billion, or the, the bar shows $137 billion. The line shows about $46 billion. That means in today's money, the giving worked out to about uh, $46 billion based on what you can spend. Now, fast forward to now, um, in 2021, last year, giving was flat. If you measure it based on total dollars, giving went up compared to 2020. Um, if you measure it based on inflation, it actually went down a little bit, which is why we're calling it flat. So we're gonna hop into donor advised funds. We're gonna talk about how donor advised funds factor into total giving in a little bit. Um, so what is a donor advised fund um, or a DAF, right? Uh, I'm gonna call them DAFs from here on out to save myself syllables. Uh, a DAF is a charitable giving account designed exclusively to invest, grow, and give assets to nonprofits for meaningful and lasting impact. So if you look at this really exciting flow chart we have here, it starts with a donor, right? So somebody donates assets to a donor advised fund, and ultimately they're going to recommend how those assets should be invested um, because it is an investment fund. Um, that donor is going to receive the tax deduction for the amount when they make the gift or that year, right? So the premise here is they can make the actual grants, not gifts, there's a big delineation, they make the actual grants um, whenever they like, but they get the tax deduction once they establish or give to uh, their donor advised fund. One benefit for donors is they can give complex assets. It doesn't need to be, say, cash. It could be securities, mutual funds, potentially crypto. So there's there's a lot of benefits in, I have these assets, what's the easiest way to give them? Perhaps a donor-advised fund. Um, so uh, once the donor-advised fund is established, the DAF sponsoring organization, which you know our three panelists today represent different DAF sponsoring organizations, um, they, they manage those assets, that investment, essentially on behalf of the donor, right? And in some ways it's treated as any other investment vehicle, but ultimately there's a really big difference because the point of it is for the money to flow to nonprofits, right? So in addition to managing the assets, they may also recommend opportunities or different nonprofits that are aligned with the donor's interests. There's a lot of benefits there. Um, I'll leave that to the panel to discuss momentarily. Um, but once, once that donor uh, decides they want money to go to a nonprofit, they recommend a grant be made to a nonprofit for a specific amount. And the DAF sponsoring organization then awards that grant to a nonprofit. Um, it's important to note that depending upon that individual or that donor's preferences, the DAF holder's preferences, um, <clears throat> the amount of information shared with the nonprofit is going to be variable. Um, so that's, that's kind of how a donor advised fund works. And to play this out, um, as of 2020, there were over 1 million donor advised funds. So that's that's a lot of individuals, families, households that have established uh, these giving accounts. That's more or less why we're having this discussion today. And one other thing to, to hit on right away, <clears throat> if you look at a private foundation, there is a minimum that each year a private foundation must grant 5% of it, its assets. 
if you look at donor advised funds, there's a number of different ways to slice and dice it, but pretty much any way you choose to look at it, more than 5% is granted out each year from donor advised funds, which means the money is truly flowing out uh, to nonprofit organizations. Um, so there's three different kinds of donor advised fund sponsoring uh, oops, sorry, I was looking for, oh yeah, three different donor advised funds sponsoring organizations. And they're buried in this chart, right? This chart shows how America gives. We're, we're typically all pretty familiar with it where religion uh, or faith-based orgs get a lot of the money. Um, but when we think about different DAF sponsoring orgs, if you make a gift uh, or set up a donor advised fund through one of these different organizations, it shows up on a different place in the pie chart. Um, so we're going to start with national charities. So these are organizations that are independent, um, and oftentimes they're affiliated with an investment firm, and they've got a national reach, right? They're not focused on a particular region, and they don't have a specific focus area, right? So as an example, Vanguard Charitable, uh, the National Philanthropic Trust, these are national DAF sponsoring organizations. Giving to one of them or establishing a DAF uh, through one of them counts as gifts to public society benefit. So if you look at the pie chart, national links to public society benefit, that's the 11% section. All right, next uh, we have community foundations. Um, so that would be represented by uh, both Karima and Lisa uh, at the Community Foundation of Greater Flint and the Arizona Community Foundation. Um, these are organizations that have a specific geographic or regional focus. So the Arizona Community Foundation encompasses the entire state of Arizona, um, whereas the Community Foundation of Greater Flint, they represent uh, primarily Flint County and another county within Michigan. Um, and so if you make a gift or set up a DAP, through uh, a community foundation that shows up in grant making foundations, which is 13% uh, of all dollars donated in the US, a little over $64 billion. Um, lastly, not represented on the panel today are single issue charities. So these are organizations that are designed to focus on one particular issue or perhaps within a specific organization. So one example of that is a Jewish Federation, right? The Jewish Federation of Rhode Island um, or the San Diego Human Dignity Foundation. Another example uh, would be Stanford University has their own DAP, right? Because Stanford has many different initiatives. If you'd like to give to one, but you don't know how much or when you could simply give to that. And then at a later date, grant it out to, to the project or area of interest. When you make a grant uh, or when you set up a DAP through a, a single issue organization, that's going to reflect that kind of organization on the pie chart. So as an example, if it's a Jewish federation, that shows up in religious giving. If it was through Stanford, that would be education. Um, one other thing here uh, that's important and I'm quoting this right out of the Giving USA report. So to minimize double counting, only the net of incoming versus outgoing donor advised funds is included in the estimate, right? So they look at the two and they say, okay, what's the total amount? What's the, the net? What's the bigger part? And, and they take that and that's how it counts. So um, ultimately it's a, it's a small difference, um, but it could have a significant effect on the public society benefit subsector if we didn't do that. So now that we've set the ground for what are DAFs and how do they show up in the Giving USA report, let's let's talk about why donor advised funds. So Vicki, can you kick us off? Absolutely, Ryan, and thank you so much for setting us up, and it's really a pleasure to be here with you and my fellow panelists. As Ryan mentioned, my name is Vicki Kelber. I represent Vanguard Charitable, which is a national donor advised fund, to put it in the, in the categories just presented. 
And the question of why donors choose to work with donor advised funds, and that trend is absolutely growing, as Ryan mentioned, you know, over a million folks already work with donor advised funds today, is pretty much as varied as those individuals. So the specific reasons that folks are choosing to work with Vanguard Charitable or Arizona Community Foundation, Community Foundation of Greater Flint, those are going to be pretty individual. Um, but I will say that, you know, from our seat, we serve a national base of about 40,000 different donors. And so we do see from all of those different donors, a couple of key themes that absolutely come through and why they've chosen to work with the DAF. Um, and I think these apply not just to us, but to other folks that are here today. So I'm excited to hear their perspectives. But um, first and foremost, folks are choosing to work with us because the Donor Advised Fund is a really easy to use giving vehicle that offers a lot of flexibility. So we take complicated things like turning complex assets and non-cash assets into cash for charities. And we take care of all of that in-house so that the donor doesn't need to worry about that. The charity doesn't need to process it. Uh, and it's available for granting in a matter of days. So it's a really easy way to manage all of your charitable giving in one place. Um, of course, invest in really high quality investments to grow it over time and to see your impact across a variety of causes from one single portal. Uh, but beyond that sort of more functional ease of use, I'd say that what we absolutely also see with our donors is that they're also working with us as a philanthropic partner. You know, these are folks who are making a long-term upfront commitment to charity. These are irrevocable gifts. So once you give into a donor advised fund, you must give that money to charity. And for most of our donors, you know, they share our mission of wanting to increase philanthropy and maximize its impact over time. So they're working with us because all of us provide, you know, a variety of resources, tools, and services that are helping to really connect donors with different nonprofits and cause areas in a way that they just wouldn't be able to do on their own through direct giving. So those are definitely the two themes that we see come through in talking to our donors. Thanks, Vicki. Um, it's awesome to know the, the national DAF perspective. Um, Lisa, can you share a little bit about the Arizona Community Foundation and, and why your donors like to set up DAFs through you? Of course, and I'll echo Vicki and being thrilled to be here today with Donor Search and my fellow panelists, and also that all of the reasons Vicki shared ring true uh, for our fund holders at Community Foundation. I'll add in addition to the types of sponsoring organizations being so diverse. There's a lot of diversity just within the community foundation world as well. There's over 750 community foundations in the US. Most, but not all are place-based and they're all structured a little bit differently, different blends of discretionary funding and donor uh, advised funds and other types of funds. Um, so I'll share, uh, Ryan, you mentioned I oversee our professional advisor outreach that the advisors also appreciate the ease of use of donor advised funds. So just like the donors, they're happy when they don't have to go and, and gather tax receipts from all different places. So our CPA partners that we work with definitely appreciate that ease of use factor as well. Most sponsoring organizations are really well equipped to handle complex gifts, so gifts of complex assets through staff or through partnerships in the advisor community. So that's a, a big reason we see donors utilizing donor advised funds, you know, in addition to cash and stock. Most sponsoring organizations can handle gifts of real estate, of art, of cryptocurrency, of business at uh, business interests. So um, the, the sophistication to be able to handle those types of gifts in a practice that tax smart philanthropy um, is a, a definite use usage reason of donor advice funds. And then community expertise, you know, most but not all of community foundation givers are place based, they want to have an impact in their local community, they're looking to their community foundation partner as boots on the ground and helping them make an impact in their community. Thanks, Lisa. That's awesome to hear about the uh, the fact that you could even give business interests as a way that I would imagine that's typically a very complex gift. Many organizations might not be apt to handle something like that. Um, so it's great that you make that easy for a donor and ultimately easier for, for the nonprofit organizations that you support. Um, Karima, can you share a little bit about the Community Foundation of Greater Flint and if there are any 
differences or other points to highlight? I think part of the uniqueness of this particular panel is the Community Foundation of Greater Flint. Yes, we're, Flint, we're called Greater Flint because you recognize Flint over Genesee County. So we've got a little bit of recognition there. But um, also, we our geographic region is Genesee County. And I guess I probably don't have to explain to you guys where Flint is. And we just know it's more than water. We are a wonderful space. Um, but we do, it is really advantageous. So then we've got Lisa here from Arizona, we're a much larger geographic reach. And then we've got Vanguard, which nationally. Now, DEFS, we can advise nationally. So if our donors have interests in other spaces and other states, uh, international, I draw the line. I'm not really there yet. <laughs> we'll see. Um, but something really great for us when we see, like the why DEFS question is, when you have a life-changing event, Sometimes, say, say it's a death in the family, say it's, it's, in my opinion, really accessible philanthropy. It's a great space to come in for our large major donors and people who could have private foundations without the master fuss or also entry level. And it's a very humane space. When you're here in a space to honor someone's legacy, instead of having their whole life plan and having to make that decision before the obituary goes out, let's start a donor advice fund. And then we can go from there and honor the, your loved one's legacy in that space or you selling a business there's always <laughs> our cpas there's always certain liabilities you can take advantage of the benefits up front and distribute your giving going along so for us we we find our greatest success in leveraging our donor advice funds especially those on the more accessible philanthropy side to meet our community needs so not any one fund has to create a grant that will fulfill a particular need we can leverage that based on giving styles and sizes so four or five different donor advice funds um, we also give what we call partners in philanthropy in front of our DAF holders, and that really goes through our community needs and then elevates unmet needs to our donor advice fund holders in that way. And, um, and we're able to utilize our donor advice funds to respond, be flexible and respond to emerging needs. So many people out there and many of your organizations have taken advantage of urgent relief funding, especially during COVID. We were able to mobilize quickly within two days because we had a deaf holder who was willing to advise the grant to then start this fund. Um, and so we really truly feel like DAFs are a great way to leverage action and activity within the community and nationwide. Thanks, Karima. That's great. One, in fact, if you if you dive into the full giving USA report, one of the things that is discussed is in fact how giving went up during the pandemic, right? And obviously the kinds of organizations that received money, uh, it shifted as far as the proportions. And to Karima's point, there were a lot of emergency funds started and donor advised funds were a big part of that. Um, before we go on to the next slide, I've got a question for the three of you because there's something that we, we didn't highlight earlier, which is the, the minimum amount of money or the minimum investment to set up a donor advised fund. It varies based on the different sponsoring organizations. So I'm just curious, could each of you share the, the kind of uh, dollar amount to, to create or establish a DAF? I think we may we, we might have one of the lower thresholds at $10,000 and that's both for endowed DAF and non-endowed DAF. And I think later we'll touch based on kind of the difference between the two. Thanks Karima. Lisa? Oh, sorry. I was just going to jump oh. in, Ryan. No, go ahead, uh, I think we're on the higher end then. We're, on, we're at $25,000. Um, but what I will say is that right now, there are donor advised funds that you can open with any minimum. So I think it actually really is helpful for the audience to get to know some of the different donor advised funds. Um, because just understanding what the minimum is might help you to understand more about donors who are giving with those different DAF vehicles. Yeah. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, to your point, historically, if an organization has seen somebody making a gift through a DAF, right, a grant, right, the grant is being awarded, that's typically an indicator that the individual is a major gift opportunity. More often than not, that's true, but with the trend that the, the entry level to establish a DAF is decreasing, um, which I personally believe is ultimately good because it makes philanthropy easier for the donors, that might not be the case anymore. So that's that's awesome that you bring that up. I'll shut up now, Lisa, because you've got important information to share. 
Sure. We are also at the $25,000 minimum to open a donor advice fund. And I, I'll just build on what you just said, Ryan. I'll, I'll pull a little bit from a recommendations uh, section is that if you are aware that you have a donor that gives through a donor advice fund, you might move them up on your, your priority um, list, your cultivation list, because you know they already have funds set aside. You know they're serious about philanthropy to go through the process of setting up a donor advice fund. So that's always a really good hint that there, like Ryan says, is a major gift opportunity there. Thanks, Lisa. And sorry, sorry to steal some of your thunder. Um, so we're going to dive into some trends now, right? So first, giving by sector. So when, when we previously discussed this, we talked about um, how we tried to hide the, the double counting or minimize the double counting. Um, and, and so not all of the money that's given always shows up in the pie chart itself, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at two different pie charts here. Um, between 2014 and 2018. And this comes directly from the, the donor advised fund chapter. Um, so the data on the left or the gold data is granting from donor advised funds, whereas the data on the right or the blue data uh, is the, the aggregate information from giving in the US as we typically count it in the, the Giving USA report. So you'll notice some differences, right? We're not gonna stay here long, but it's just important to highlight some of these when you think about what might the average DAF holder have an interest in. Um, so the biggest difference is that education and religion are swapped, right? Um, so if you look, uh, religion on the right is 31%. Um, and education is 14%, where if you look on the left, what's going on with donor advised fund grants, 29% is education, 14% is religion. So they're almost identically swapped. Um, you'll notice there's no gifts to grant making foundations or the individuals, which are 12 and 1% respectively. Um, and so that's, that's fully removed. Um, Giving to the arts more than doubles, it moves from 4% to 9%. Giving to public society benefit, it grows uh, over 50%. It moves from 8 to 12. And giving to the environment slash animals moves up almost 50% from 3 to 5. So there are some differences when grants are being awarded as opposed to giving in the whole within the U.S. Um, so now we're going to talk about a few different uh, data points from the National Trust's 2021 DAF report. Um, if this is interesting to you, you can just Google 2021 uh, National Trust DAF report, and you can find this report online for free with a lot of great infographics. Um, so that said, this data is used in the Giving USA's uh, DAF chapter. What we're looking at here is uh, data between 16 and 20, um, and it shows the value of total grants made by donor advised funds. Right, so this is all donor advised funds, even though that says giving to national donor advised funds, that's me with a typo. This is granting um, to all uh, or from all donor advised funds. So if you see in 2018, uh, there's nearly $16 billion that was granted from all donor advised funds. Or as if you fast forward to 2020, um, there's a little over $34 billion granted. Right, so over that two year period, the, or the four year period, the amount of money that has been granted has doubled, right? So that's incredible growth when you think about giving uh, from or granting from donor advised funds. Um, next is uh, people giving to donor advised funds. Man, I apologize, folks. I really botched the headlines on these slides. Um, so, if you look, again, it's the same report looking at data from 16 to 20. Um, so the contributions increase more slowly uh, than grant making, right? So in the previous slide, we saw the grant making doubled. On this slide, that's not quite the case. So contributions to donor advised funds in 2020 
totaled $47.85 billion, which is an all time high, right? That surpasses the um, 2019 data, which had it at $39.69 billion. So that's a little over a 20% increase for this here, right? So giving two donor advised funds, we talked about a million uh, DAFs that exist. So as you imagine, when it gets to a million, giving two is increasing, but not at the rate uh, that people are granting from uh, DAFs, which ultimately means the money is flowing through uh, to nonprofits. Um, lastly here, um, we're going to focus on the annual payout rate for all donor advised funds, right? So payout rate is calculated by total grants awarded in one year divided by total assets of the previous year. So we're gonna make it really simple. We're gonna look at 2020 and we're just gonna pretend that that's one specific organization to explain how it's counted. So if an organization had a hundred million in assets in 2019, and they granted out $23.8 million in 2020, that means there's a payout rate of 23.8. So that's how we get to payout rates. And earlier we talked about, if you look at um, <clears throat> private foundations, there's a minimum of 5% payout rate. On, on average here, if we look at the annual payout rate, it's, it's over four times that. Um, the, the highlight here, aside from that, is this is the highest payout rate there has been in over a decade. Um, and you could, looking at Karima's previous comments, point to the fact that the pandemic may have helped to accelerate some of this, um, but not all of it. Um, so with that said, uh, we're going to kick it off and go through some recent trends. So Vicki, can you tell us trends that you've seen or anything else um, in the data that, that I didn't get to cover? Absolutely. Well, you know, I run a data science team, so I'm always all about looking at what are some of the trends in the data around giving generally, and of course, giving with DAFs. Uh, so I think, you know, a couple of things you just touched on absolutely are some of the major trends that I think are important to know. You know, this is a growing opportunity for nonprofits. Folks are using these giving vehicles increasingly across every spectrum of um, the American people. And so it's really something that I think we are absolutely paying more attention to, which the Giving USA report has done in this special chapter. I think more broadly, what we've seen is something that probably most nonprofits have seen in the last couple of years, which is you know, the ways that we use to connect with donors, and we're absolutely included in this. Uh, was much more, you know, kind of typical fundraising, right? We'd have events, we'd have volunteering, uh, we might send out some direct mail, I even kind of put email in these categories. Uh, and what we've seen, and especially since the pandemic, I mean, absolutely accelerate is this movement of giving into the digital space. Um, and as a national donor advised funds, in some ways that works really well for us, of course, because so many of our, our donors primary interaction with us is online. Uh, but it's it's particularly challenging for nonprofits. You know, it's really a new model of how people want to connect and interact with you, uh, and involves going beyond, I think, much of our typical sort of fundraising approaches. So, you know, for us, when COVID nineteen really began in early twenty twenty, our donors were like I think everyone here on the panel immediate in their reaction. Our first grant started going out in January of that year. So we had this amazing response, but we also had this incredible demand. You know, donors were coming to us and saying, where can I make an impact? You know, I want to know more about what is going on in my specific community, which you can imagine is challenging with 40,000 different donors. Uh, and I also want to know more about what's going on in other communities that I'm reading about in the news or that I'm seeing are really hard hit. And how do I know where to give in those particular areas? And so you know, our team kind of riding the wave of this trend into, you know, digital tools went out to our donors. We did a bunch of, you know, experimentation and testing with them around what would really help them in this situation. And we had to do that quite quickly to mount a timely response. And, you know, later that year in the fall of 2020, what we were able to bring forward is a free public website. So you can go onto our website and find this tool. Uh, we created a, a smart search engine called the Nonprofit Aid Visualizer. So donors could go in, overlay all these different, you know, information about charities, essentially. So data about the charities that they wanted to give to, what cause area, 
you know, how big are these charities? How old are they? How well established? Um, and then overlay that with geographic data that, you know, shows you in those charities areas, what are the communities that are the hardest hit by COVID-19 or where are the communities that are the most vulnerable to the pandemic? We got a great uh, data partnership together to bring all of these different tools to bear. So we launched that in the fall and we just saw incredible donor and public engagement with the Navi tool and that's continued actually to this day, although we had hoped that we'd be able to retire it by this point. Um, and so we've continued with that. You know, you can see on our website, we offer lots and lots of different public free resources, not just for our donors, uh, but for any donor to come and be able to be a bit more intentional and informed with their giving. Because what we see is, you know, donors have this demand, but when they access these types of resources, they're actually able to give more and to give more impactfully. So it's really additive in the charitable space if you're able, again, to make this shift, which we absolutely, you know, we're privileged to be able to do, but was something that was really new for us and I'm sure would be very new for most nonprofits. Thanks, Vicki. That's, that's awesome that you created that. What um, I'll ask if you could put into the chat the that website that you mentioned, because I personally want to play around with it. Um, <laughs> and and it's awesome to hear that as people engage more, they're more likely to make more gifts, regardless of whether or not um, they're involved with, with you through a DAV. Um, so that said, Lisa, can you tell us the trends that you've seen at the Arizona Community Foundation? Of course. Thank you. So I would echo Vicki in that donors are looking to be more intentional, more informed. Uh, Donor Advice Fund at a community foundation has a little bit different structure um, in that one, we're lucky we don't have quite as much ground to cover uh, expertise wise as, as Vicki may. Um, but we're able to, we, we provide a customized experience and every donor um, is paired with a relationship manager. So I have a portfolio of donors, just like many of you. And so um, again, that, that increased intentionality um, and being informed, um, but also the evolution of trust-based philanthropy. I think that's something we've been hearing a lot in the philanthropic space, especially in the last two to three years. And um, that's something we're always encouraging with our donors, unrestricted grants to nonprofits, not uh, implementing unnecessary reporting. And we're seeing more and more donors embrace that, which is really exciting. We have traditionally seen, uh, we have donor advised fund holders and then we have legacy donors. So those plan giving donors and they were two separate pools. We're seeing more and more of our donor advised fund holders also having a vision for carrying on their philanthropic goals after lifetime, which has been really great to see. Uh, and to build on that, we're seeing more and more multi-generational philanthropy. Karina mentioned earlier that a donor advised fund is an accessible tool. So you don't have to have millions of dollars to set up a, a private foundation to engage kids and grandkids. Uh, many donors will have a, a taxable event, you know, a, a sale of a business or something in one year, and then they can use that to engage the next generations. Um, and then just again, the, the, the increasing sophistication of donors and their professional advisors, and we use that term to cover anyone advising donors around their wealth. So their CPAs, their investment advisors, their state planning attorneys on tax smart philanthropy. And um, it's really exciting to see advisors recommending philanthropy to their clients. Yes, I think, Lisa, thank you for the perfect setup for exactly what I was thinking here. If you, I mean, if you were to take the Venn diagram of donor advice fund holders and your donors, it's a, we're right on top of it. We're, we're target, nailed it, right? So our demographic and your demographic in this particular space, it's one in one. So these trends, I think it's really helpful in your area. So we have Vanguard again, nationally, you're going to have, that's the beauty of it. You're going to have the same um, coast to coast, right? Now, community foundations, again, we're going to have slightly different variations. So definitely understanding the recent giving trends and the giving the trends there might vary between geographic area, one to the next. But um, my thing is, We've talked about the life-changing events, major catalysts here, but there's a shout out, I'm reading that shout out. There's a definite difference between generosity and charity. So the phrase, you know, charity starts at home. I'm going to throw it in the bin, but, but I'll come back with 
generosity starts at home, charity starts with policy. So really, truly, we've got donors who are relying on another group or another party to help them navigate this policy. So the trends we've seen here is um, understanding that our donors want to be accessible to the community and so into your needs. And so the more that we as community foundations or bodies that are advising, so in community foundations, it's a little, it's smaller. So we're going to advise our donors in more spaces as to unmet need. So the more that we can go in that space, that will help with the trend of your knowledgeable donor, your entry level donor, your advanced donor. And then, um, and then if, especially if you, I struggled this, my background prior to being at a community foundation, I was at a hospital, city charter hospital foundation. And I kept thinking, I'm losing donors to these things called DAFs. What is going on? What is this DAF and who done it? And so I really, I, I set up a meeting with our, the CEO of our local, our, now where I work, I guess it was my first interview and I didn't even know, but I said, how can I align our best interests? And if you're event driven for, for donors, donor advice funds are amazing in that space where there's no exchange, it's pure charity. It's not necessarily generosity or marketing. There's no deliverables back for it. So really understanding and how to take advantage of the donor advice funds in this space. I'm seeing a big trend there in nonprofits, understanding more how to work with sponsoring organizations. So I, I'm really blowing our next segment on recommendations. <laughs> Believe me, there's so much more down there. But I really I wanted to tie that in. So the trends, they, it goes both ways. So the trends in giving and the trends in using and then I mentioned earlier, we would talk about endowed and non-endowed. So if you look at the national data, especially for us in Michigan, it's a bit different, our data in Michigan than the rest of the states in that Michigan tend to, tends to have more endowed donor advised funds than other states and community foundations, our model is endowment. And so yes, we have non-endowed and majority of our, our DAFs are non-endowed, but the idea is to have the endowment, to have the succession planning, multi-generations, that can be involved in a donor advised fund that now third generation isn't caught running a private foundation that they really had no interest, but really wanna honor grandma's legacy. Um, and so really truly, when we set up a donor advised fund, I wanna know that those donors interests so we can be proactive in bringing opportunities, even if it's not a current unmet need, if it's just an opportunity to stay ahead of. So those are trends on our end that we'll see is really trying to get to know the purpose and the why behind the DAF holder so we can help match that more meaningfully. And also there's gonna be your autonomous DAF holders who really just say like, don't call me, don't mess with me. I'm gonna go online and I'm gonna take care of it. <laughs> and if you email me, that's just a disturbance. And the other ones are like, let's email and talk about this 35 times before we're gonna make that grant. And so our giving trends are, we're seeing much more advising out of grants. We're really trying to get that mobility and not having funds sit there. So they're out in the community, um, and which has been excellent. So overall last year, um, just under 20% of our overall number of grants, not our total dollars in grant making, but number of grants out came from donor advised funds where the donor is the catalyst. And, um, and I'm gonna hand that one off because I could, if I could cover one more topic, I'm gonna put us over time. Well, D Karima, do you just want to dive into recommendations? Since you're already At on first, <laughs> um, I, yes, but I, all right, go for it. So in that conversation I mentioned earlier, where I'm thinking, what is this DAF and why am I losing sponsors on event revenue in my previous position? Um, and having to understand, so truly, I, I think for sure, I know Lisa Community Foundations, Vicki, we've talked about this, it's challenging when we have our recommendations for nonprofits, I probably spend about four hours a week saying, okay, I'm not gonna tell you what to do, but if I were you, I might create another record in your in your, in your database system. So um, we're gonna, okay, I'm not mentioning any names, but <laughs> in your particular system and soft credit or have an additional contributor to the DAF holder. So we are less sophisticated than perhaps Arizona and Vanguard in this space where we don't have as much information provided. So you'll have the DAF name. Not all DAF holders have their names. It's sometimes there's a certain level of anonymity involved in there. And so definitely, and I'll reach out. There's typically, it's not HIPAA. There's a lot of spaces, unless a donor wants to be anonymous, we're not gonna give that information, but 
encouraging the stewardship in that way and encouraging um, yourself like to have it in there. So if you might understand that, but say you're the next person down the line, when you're retrieving the data, I always say this reporting without an asterisk where it's true data that you're retrieving back and you don't have to rely on an individual's knowledge of having that in the system. This, it came from, this grant came from XYZ Fund of I'll use CFGF, Community Foundation. When I'm pulling that, it's not just a bucket that it came from the Community Foundation because did it come from a competitive grant cycle? Was it a proactive grant? Was it a donor advised grant? So understanding your funding source is really important to understanding how to steward it. And certainly put that donor on the mailings reach out, go to coffee, steward that donor. Um, you cannot do recognition in lieu of recognizing where the DAF came from, because then we might, IRS, there is a fine line with IRS, but you're, you're supporting, your DAF sponsoring organizations, really part of what we do is navigating that in a responsible way on behalf of getting ourselves not into sticky situations. Um, and then I can jump right into it. So if I forget anything, I'll circle back at the end and hand the torch off. We can go reverse Lisa or Vicki. I'm happy to jump in, Lisa. Um, so I love this question. I mean, just like Kareem, I have this conversation all the time with nonprofit partners, and I used to also work in development. And so I wish that I knew more <laughs> about how to work with donor advised funds. So I think my job would have been a lot easier. Um, but what I'll say, you know, we have a, an entire website of resources, first and foremost, for nonprofits and working with DAF. So I'll, I'll put that into the chat so that everybody has that. Um, and that's applicable to most donor advised fund sponsors, not just Vanguard Charitable. So we really encourage you to take a look there. Pulling from that website, I'd say I kind of have a top three tips that I usually make sure people are aware of. So you know, number one is to keep your GuideStar profile as complete and up to date as possible. The GuideStar charitable database at this point does serve as the back end uh, data tool for so many DAF sponsors, including ourselves, to provide our donors with charitable data right there in their grant making experience. They can see that it's the right charity, they can explore new charities, and the more information you put there, the more likely they are to want to engage with you and make a grant to your organization. So absolutely keep that GuideStar profile up to date. Uh, the second piece is actually related to um, something that Karima was also talking about in terms of, you know, actually how do you get these donors information? And I always say, actually, the first step is getting the donation. Uh, so make sure that on your website, you have something about the fact that if you are a 501c3 public charity, you are able to accept grants from donor advised funds and very tactically put your employment identification number or EIN right there on the website. Because for most of our donors, they might need to leave and go to our portal to actually initiate that grant. So just make it super easy for them. And I think um, you know some donors don't realize that they get give to some of their favorite organizations using their DAF. So it's a great moment to provide that piece of education. Uh, we looked at this in 2020 with the research partners of ours, and so we found only about 5% of organizations do this today. So I think it's a really simple but powerful change folks can make to help solicit those donations, or excuse me, grants. Um, and then the final piece is absolutely echoing what Karima said, which is our donors want to connect with you. And, you know, we're really here to help serve as those connectors between donors and the nonprofits that they care about. So. You know, for our donors, they do provide a pretty high level of information on the grant payment letter that we provide. Uh, you can see an example of that on the website that I gave. And so train your teams on how to recognize these grant payment letters when they get those checks. Like Karima said, you know, make another record in your database that says it came from this fund. This is the information they sent to us. Um, and for the donors that provide for us, you know, the things like their address that you can get in touch with them. They're doing that because they want to hear from you. So send them a thank you, not a tax substantiation letter. Um, and that's really the key point. You know, you get to do away with all of that paperwork and really just focus on that relationship with the donors. Uh, because, you know, for most of our donors, they're making an average of $10,000 grants every single time they recommend a grant. They are sending the majority of those funds, both in terms of units and dollars, out unrestricted. So there's no reporting requirements for you. You can use them for your area of greatest need. Uh, and they really just want to hear from you about what their impact is, what you're doing. 
Uh, so it can be one of, I think, the you know smoothest major gift stewardship relationships that a fundraiser can experience. But having that information and being really set up to get those gifts is absolutely key. Vicki and I'll, I want to chime in. One of the most common mistakes I see is including tax information on the donor level. And I want to help steward that gift for you, that grant for you. But when I receive a thank you letter and it has tax information, I have to decide, is the donor, can I make a note? Is the donor savvy enough to understand that this isn't a tax deductible gift because they received their tax deduction when they made their gift into their fund? Do I need to call or email the, the nonprofit to ask them to issue a new letter, which might take some time to get a hold of someone? I might not have time to do it that day. So it's just going to delay the process. I Make sure you're not including your tax deductible language on your thank you letters. Um, thank the donor, reference the fund, but just make it about stewardship. You know, like Vicki said, you get to take that piece away and you don't have to worry that piece of it. And even if you receive a grant where the donor did opt to be an Anonymous. We still want to help you steward that. We'll still get the thank you to them, even if you don't uh, get their name when you receive the check. So still keep passing that on. Um, that's one of my favorite parts of my job is when I get to connect a donor and an organization who is making the impact that that donor wants to have and see that relationship flourish, see that donor set up multi-year grants. Um, that's just, that's one of the best parts of our, our job and, and we wanna help you do it. Um, uh, uh, Vicki mentioned just making sure people know that you're in the business, that you can accept grants from Donor Advice Fund. Um, some uh, neat thing I've seen some nonprofits in our community do is actually put links to common donor, uh, donor Advice Fund portals on their website. So their donors can just go and click on that link and it'll take them right to Vanguard's portal. It'll take them right to the Arizona Community Foundation's portal and they can easily log in and make a grant recommendation while they're thinking of it. I was at another webinar where uh, the nonprofit said that they put donor advice funds, um, you know, they mentioned it on everything that they do. So make it easy, um, let people know they're in the business. And I hope this was able to kind of take some of the you know, mystique out of donor advice funds and clarify that they're simply a giving tool through which donors and prospects you already know are contributing. So, you know, you can look at annual reports um, of fund holders at community foundations and that on, but the most important thing is identifying your donors that give through a donor advice fund because they're ripe for cultivation, making it easy on them, letting your donors know you're in the business. Um, and even though there's no magic bullet, you know, find new donors with um, uh, sponsoring organizations, I will say reach out to your local community foundation. We want to be a conduit, not a gatekeeper. We want to get to know you and your work and make those connections. Um, you know, and, and we're nonprofits uh, with limited staff and capacity, just like all of you, but but we still want to make the effort to do that. And, and, and we have a great, great team here to help us do that. Um, Karima, before we wrap up, maybe I can kick it back over to you to just touch base briefly on events and benefits. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, and I, I, I feel like I'm still in both positions. I can speak very clearly to both sides of this fence. So one big thing is, and part of our role in protecting the donors is we really can't have a good or service in exchange for advising a grant. And that might seem obvious in some spaces, but if I'm advising this grant and, and we have an event and here are tickets to this, we can't do that. So we that's when we want to be conduits, like Lisa said, and not gatekeepers, is because we're here to protect your organization, the donors, and our organizations as, as all of it to create the most beneficial space that we can all grow together. And um, so one of those things is in that space, when you have the event sponsors and you have your events, this pure charity, not generosity, pure charity, people will give without an exchange. That was a very challenging thing for me to transition to into the community foundation field is understanding that and donor advice funds truly preclude, exclude all of that benefit in that exchange. And so definitely steward your donors, but really keep that space where if you have tickets, that's a fixed cost. You've got a cost, you have a fair market value to that that you can't do. And then, and that saves you guys. So you can avoid these fixed costs and have pure charity and giving, and you don't have to name a room after somebody. Now, if you would like to steward your donors in a particular way, 
certainly go do it, but please not in exchange for. And um, in that space, like those of you, many are event driven. This can understanding and becoming intimate with the donor advice funds, especially your donors in that space, can can also help take that pressure off of being so reliant on event revenue. Um, and Vicky, listen, I want Vicky's donor ten thousand dollars. Their average to grant side. Let's see, ours goes down as low as two hundred and fifty dollars. The largest one I've processed is one hundred and fifty thousand. So really, truly, anywhere in between. But um, that that kind of stuff is it's great. So understanding that it doesn't have to be an exchange, and also even more so that it doesn't have to be in certain spaces. There cannot be an exchange. Um, but we want to make sure that if you're using the events to educate and steward your donors in those ways certainly provide an educational experience for them, but they can't receive fair, anything with fair market value back in return or exchange for advising the grant. And I also want to do shout out to Naples Zoo. I saw you on there, although from Michigan, I don't miss my primate cruise every winter. So thank you very much, sorry. That's awesome, thanks Karima. Um, so we're gonna hop into q and I'm not sure how long we have, but really quickly, I just dropped into the chat um, the Giving USA website. So if you're interested in accessing the chapter and the rest of the report, um, you can go there to subscribe. Also, if you're a community foundation, um, there are the email addresses of two of our um, researchers uh, at the IU Lilly School of Philanthropy. And you could reach out to them if you're interested in sharing your anonymized data to helping grow the report. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to kick it back to Jay. And before I do, uh, thanks so much, everybody, for staying on thus far. And thank you so much, uh, Vicki, Lisa, and Karima. That this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Ryan. And thank you, everybody. Really great, great conversation. Such great information. And uh, you can tell from the questions we've been seeing in Q and A. Not only that, there's a lot of uh, interest, but that you've actually answered. <laughs> I think the bulk of what everyone was asking uh, from the issue about uh, whether or not names were visible um, uh, to how to make sure that information is available to the donor advice funds, to all of you uh, advising those with those funds. So um, I think that probably much of this has been tackled. We did have a couple of uh, logistical uh, or you know book, uh, uh, housekeeping questions, one of which was about the recording. And once again, a recording of this entire session will be posted to the DonorSearch YouTube channel, but also on the DonorSearch site, which is at DonorSearch.net. Um, but also we can take the questions that are here in case we have missed anything or a nuance for one, share that with our panelists so that uh, if they wish to um, have some interaction on that topic or they can provide us some responses to share with you in a future date, we'll be happy to do that. Um, also, you should feel free to reach out uh, to uh, us at DonorSearch um, with any of your questions uh, or comments, both about this program and about future programs and ideas for these programs. While we've tackled things related to Giving USA before, obviously uh, covering a subject like this one with this tremendous growth is, is new for us. And we are very grateful uh, to Vicki, uh, Lisa, Karima, and obviously to you, Ryan, for pulling this together. So since we're at the hour, I'm gonna take the liberty of just adding my thanks um, and encouraging all of you to um, Go to the chat before we disappear here to grab those resources that uh, Vicki had mentioned. If anybody needs those in the future, of course, there's Ryan's email address. I'll also add mine, which is j at donorsearch.net. And uh, we'll be happy to answer those questions offline. Um, additionally, if you're interested in more about this series and other things we're doing, you'll find that there's more content coming at you. Again, all of that's listed at DonorSearch.net, um, including some new programs which will be launched very, very soon, uh, including a number of programs I'll be doing from England and Scotland, and uh, a new episode of the podcast with an interview with Stacey Palmer, where she talks about her history and how she got to the Chronicle and all the stories she's written about. So I hope you'll listen to that wherever you get your podcasts. So with that, I'll close out our program today. Again, extend our thanks to these incredible, incredible panelists, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Till then, take care. Thanks so much, Jay and Ryan. Thanks, Kareem and Lisa. See you soon. Thank you all. See you. Bye. Thank you.